Great. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for examining history through recipes, Crofton cookbooks. Um, but we are going to start uh, tonight and I'll just introduce myself and then I'll let Kathy introduce herself here too. But my name is Nicole Stocker. I'm the museum education manager with the Dunn Museum and the Lake County Forest Preserves. Um, so welcome again. And Kathy, I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay. Um, Kathy Lambrecht. I always put it print Catherine Lambrecht, but that's just me. Uh, I'm with Culinary Historians and the Highland Park Historical Society, which I'm treating this as my meeting for the month on both occasions because I sometimes run myself a little ragged. But my key interest is on um, food history. But I'm also, like I said, a program director for the Highland Park Historical Society. And I do programs for Chicago Foodways Roundtable. So I think we're good, right? Yeah. All right. There we go. All right. So for um, tonight's program, um, we are going to be focusing on two cookbooks from the Dunn Museum's collection. So we want to begin tonight by sharing a little bit more about the history of those cookbooks, and uh, then we'll dive into some delicious recipes. Our program tonight centers around this cookbook to begin with. Um, and this handwritten cookbook was made and used by Mary Ethel Crofton, later Hunt, who wrote on the first page, Mary Ethel Crofton, Fort Sheridan, Illinois, November, 1895. And Mary was the daughter of uh, Gabrielle Josephine Schubert Crofton and Colonel Robert Erstine Anderson Crofton. And he was Colonel of the 15th Infantry and Commander of Troops at Fort Sheridan uh, from January of 1891 until October of 1896. And the U.S. Army Post at Fort Sheridan was in operation from 1887 until 1993. And when the fort closed, part of the land was donated to the Lake County Forest Preserves. And today that includes roughly 321 acres, uh, with an additional 72 acres acquired just last year through a transfer of ownership from open lands. Now, when the fort closed, there was also a museum at the base and our staff worked to acquire a vast array of collections items from that museum including dozens of artifacts and nearly 3,000 photographs and postcards that date from the 1890s to the 1980s. Uh, many of these have been digitized and you can actually look through them on the Illinois Digital Archives website. Since then though, we have continued to expand our collection with new acquisitions, including those related to Fort Sheridan's history. And the Crofton cookbooks we're discussing today were donated to the Dunn Museum along with a portrait of Colonel Crofton in 2019. And here you can see that portrait. So Colonel Crofton's military career began during the American Civil War when he enlisted in 1861. He rose up through the ranks, gaining notoriety for his service, particularly during the battles of Shiloh, Chickamauga, and Mission Ridge. And after the war, he was stationed in the western part of what was becoming the United States and became a colonel in October of 1886 and then commanded the 16th Infantry at Fort Buford, North Dakota until January of 1891. He married Gabrielle Josephine Schubrick in January of 1864. And Gabrielle stems from prominent French American relatives, including the founders of the DuPont Company. Together, they had six children, with Mary Ethel being the youngest. And sadly, few of the children actually lived to adulthood or far into adulthood, as you could see here. So Colonel Crofton, though, took command at Fort Sheridan as the fourth post commandant in January of 1891. And he would have lived with his family at 111 Logan Loop in building number nine, which was the post commandant's quarters. And in this photo, you can actually see it at the end here. You can see my cursor. So building nine sits at the end of the officer's loop um, highlighted here and right on Lake Michigan, 
which you can see with my handy arrow. Um, this building, as well as building eight directly across, were completed in 1890, just a year before the Crofton family's occupancy. And these were designed in Queen Anne style, which is different from the rest of the buildings at the post. They were considered unusually luxurious for military housing at the time, as you can see here. Um, so the Crofton family would have resided in this building and would have been one of the first occupants, potentially. Now, the Croftons were at Fort Sheridan during the early establishment of the base, but also some very significant events, including the only test of the fort's true mission, which was to keep the peace in the city of Chicago when President Cleveland ordered troops into the city during the Pullman strike of May to July, 1894. And here you can see a photo of tents with those troops camped out down in Chicago. Now, tragically, Gabrielle passed away at the fort in December of 1894 of apoplexy. Um, the newspaper reports she was 60, but math tells us she was about 59, actually. She was transported back to her hometown of Wilmington, Delaware by train, and her funeral and burial took place there. And Colonel Crofton appears to have taken a leave of absence with his family from December of 1894 until April of 1895. As this book, The History of Fort Sheridan, documents the post commandants, um, this was compiled in 1944, and you can see the neat cover and first page, but here you can see Crofton listed twice with a separation period where Samuel Ovenshine takes place, takes his place. Um, when he returned to the fort in April of 1895, or excuse me, yes, 1895, Colonel Crofton brought at least the youngest two daughters with him, and he then served as post commandant at the fort until October of 1896. So Mary Ethel Crofton's cookbook was written during this time, November of 1895, when she was about 20 years old and almost a year after her mother's passing. Perhaps these recipes were prepared by her or planned along with a cook in the post commandant's quarters and could have been served to area dignitaries or high ranking officials or those that were visiting the fort and the commandant's quarters. Now, again, the first page here shows us Mary Ethel Crofton, Fort Sheridan, November, or excuse me, Illinois, November of 1895. And these recipes in this book are only filled about a quarter of the way through. Um, so with each of these recipes here, uh, you can see that there are quite a few different types, but a lot of them are actually focused on baking, uh, breads, and desserts. And the ones that are highlighted in orange are actually ones that Kathy and I have tried. So um, there's starting to be a bigger list of those, um, as you can see. Now, many of the recipes are also credited to various individuals and or forts, which is interesting though the last four are actually credited to the Washington Post. And I began working with this cookbook in December of 2020 as part of an effort to create more virtual content to share with audiences during that time. And I listed first out all of these recipes and then decided to start with one that seemed somewhat familiar. And that was for soft ginger cookies. Years ago, I actually found my great grandmother's recipe for molasses cookies, and I've been making these every December since. Um, and the ingredients and instructions between the two were similar enough that I could fill in gaps in Mary's recipe with my great grandmother's recipe. So those included things like baking time and temperature, estimated amount of flour. As you can see here, Mary states just to add enough to make a light dough. Um, and the biggest part here uh, was mixing the batter by hand for the full 10 minutes listed, which I did do. <laughs> so that's a tough, tough part to, uh, to try. Um, if you've watched the related YouTube video that I linked to in the email, um, I also realized after working more with the handwriting in the cookbook, some of the words that I had missed before too. So 
Um, there are actually a listing here for how many eggs and uh, it actually does list two teaspoons of soda, I believe, baking soda, not water, um, which was my guess based off my family's recipe. So these turned out pretty well for my first attempt with historic baking. Um, and after this, I continued trying out various recipes and making several videos, which you may have watched on our YouTube. Um, hominy bread, which turned out okay. It wasn't the tastiest dish I've made, but it was decent. So I, you know, I wouldn't deter you from trying it. Um, and then my first failure, which is my nemesis to this day, Parker House Rolls. Um, I have attempted this recipe twice and still failed at this complex recipe. It takes two days. It involves measurements like a teacup of homemade yeast and butter the size of an egg, which is my favorite measurement out of these cookbooks. Um, so what is supposed to be a fluffy, buttery roll that again, you start at 10 at night, uh, bring out 10 the next morning and don't roll and cut and bake until 4 p.m. turned out to be flat tacos, as you can see here. So they did not rise uh, very well. I tried a couple different versions of yeast so um, I'm very curious when we get to the sharing part, if anybody attempted this, because it's an interesting recipe. Um, the most delicious recipe I've tried so far is uh, caramel cake, which tastes like one of my favorite candies. So um, this one was pretty straightforward. And uh, after setting up, you can see here's the cake with its sauce. And once the sauce sets, it was um, very delicious. Um, then I tried a couple more. I've tried scotch cakes, which was pretty straightforward recipe and actually one of the more delicious ones too. I think this was one of my husband's favorites because sometimes he gets to be the taster as well. Um, and one for raspberry ice. And I partly chose this one because of a Disney movie, um, that has this in one of the songs, um, cause I thought it'd be fun. Mary Poppins mentions this in the Jolly Holiday song. So, um, this was very messy to prepare, but it was pretty tasty. So I would give this one pretty good ranking. Now, as you can see with each recipe, there are challenges to overcome. And I'll discuss more of those with some more recent ones that I've done in a little later. Um, but Historic baking provides unique challenges from reading the handwriting and transcribing it to then filling in missing pieces to adapt these recipes for today. And some of that has to do with measurements. Some of it has to do with ingredients that are available at different time periods or different brands of ingredients that are available at different time periods, sizes of ingredients, um, and even those baking times and temperatures so after beginning to work with this cookbook, I contacted Kathy as I was aware of her expertise and cooking uh, cookbook clubs and other things. And we started collaborating to try to figure out more of this cookbook. Um, we worked on transcribing recipes and different programs. So this is actually the third time we've done a virtual program like this. Um, hence why we've got a little bit longer list of recipes we've tried. But I'm going to turn it over to Kathy to share for a bit about some of her cooking experiences with this book, including some more recent ones. You're talking about your favorite ingredient measurement being the butter the size of an egg. Mm -hmm. um, I told you about this recently, but the Straits matzo ball mix, S-T-R-E-I-T-S, they have make the matzo ball dough the size of a walnut. And that's on a contemporary package. I think that's just so thrilling. Um, so Nicole and I, like she mentioned, we've been going back and forth and occasionally um, some things become my effort. So when we started this a few years ago, one of the first things I did was stuffed eggs because you really can't get too, too far off track with stuffed eggs. And of course I stuffed it and then I put on their little leaf of parsley like they told me to do. Um, cornmeal gems. I didn't understand what this business was of gems. And then I started to find there was a whole bunch of other recipes with the word gems in it. 
And then I learned the slide on the, the, on the side, those are gem company molds. You could pick whatever mold you wanted and then you prepare the recipe. Now I don't have a gem mold. I have seen them, they're just lovely, but this is just a small muffin pan. It, it, it did the job, it, it fitted in quite well. Um, stewed peas, um, you know, my family is often the ones who get to taste this food too. And I said, well, thank you for trying this today. And my dad says, every day is an experiment. This was not very difficult. Uh, um, it couldn't go wrong. That's all I could say. And there they are, the stewed peas. And I used a chipped plate, which I won't do in the future. Uh, chicken terrapin. Uh, Nicole sent me a note. She goes, did you really do tech chicken terrapin? And I've got at least the slide to prove it, though I don't remember that much about the experience. But I also found the this recipe in a uh, Ann Arbor cookbook, uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, federal cake. Kathy, um, we're missing your slides. Could you reach? You're not seeing them? them? Nope. Oh, I didn't just know seeing your lovely face. I'm not oh, I'm so slides. sorry that I no, didn't no worry. share well. Hold on, sharing is caring. Okay, great. Okay, well, here we go. Um, so I, I didn't realize, but here's the stuffed eggs, uh, the original statement with our translation as best as we could. The stuffed eggs with the, the little sprig of parsley sticking out because doesn't it just look much more lovely that way? Um, the cornmeal gems, and then I found there was a lot of recipes that referred to the word gems. And then I understood later it was related to these uh, molds. That's from the gem company, thus gems. Um, I just made these muffins in a small muffin tin. But there you go. Not a gem, but good enough. Um, stewed peas, which I just met, mentioned, uh, you know, it was fine. Lettuce, I guess a little additional roughage. Chicken terrapin, it was not something I had had before. I can't say it reminded me of a turtle, but maybe, perhaps. I don't know if it was even intended, but I always associate the word terrapin with turtle. Federal cake. This is one of those cakes uh, relative to my experience with other um, older books. Federal cake was something when there was still suffrage and people really wanted to, uh, were rallying to vote. This was something that was served. When you go into books later after they've received the ability to um, vote, the cake, at least by that name, disappears, though the cake may still be there with just another name. But when they were protesting, it was federal cake. Um, I made this in a in a loaf form, and it was okay. Uh, President Benjamin Harrison cake. Uh, now I can't say that I actually made this cake, but I certainly have the ingredients. But here somebody had done it, so I I didn't have to. Uh, snow pudding. This turned out to be an incomplete recipe. And I couldn't understand how to handle it until I found online this pamphlet by Peter Cooper. Uh, so there's like Peter Cooper housing village in New York, same Peter Cooper, but he also was, um, he, he allegedly was, I say allegedly because I think this is one of those things where there's a number of people who claim but he he came up with the, the the ability to create the gelatin in a way. And this was the recipe for snow pudding. This is the recipe I ended up following because this one was incomplete. But I've also seen snow pudding without attribution to anybody in cookbooks since that time. Um, and of course it had to have some custard for it to lay on somehow that that makes everything just a little bit more festive. Apple cream. Uh, we're going to have another recipe coming up 
which is somewhat at least similar in jest, but it, this was not one of those where my family said, I want to enthusiastically eat this again. This was not in that category. Um, baked apple pudding. I realize we're doing, I've done a lot of apples. Um, that was much better. Um, green sauce for fish. This is one of the new ones from this current batch. Uh, and when she said green sauce for fish, I didn't even look at the recipe. I said, I'll do it because it reminded me there's this, in Munich, there's this greener, greener sauce, whatever, um, which I had one time guests from Europe and I served it. They were from Germany. They had never had it before, but they were aware of it. This is a much simpler version uh, with the mayonnaise and finely chopped parsley, uh, the anchovy paste, which I think if you were going to make it today, it just don't keep anchovy paste at home. I think you could get away using fish sauce. Um, I served it. Uh, okay, so what did I have that was fishy at home? I had fish sticks. I had octopus, which I been rolling around the freezer waiting for me to do something with it. And then I had these salmon burgers, which I bought for Lent because I was curious what a salmon burger was like. I'm not that excited about it, but this sauce on top, makes it much better. Uh, I would do it again. Uh, this is my moment of it's almost ready, but I didn't fry it. So I don't, I haven't really truly finished making the chicken croquettes, but the next time around, whenever we do this series, I will have a picture of the chicken croquettes, which would be right here, but it's not. Um, molasses candy. I took this on and it turns out it's a, it's a type of taffy, or at least the way it's made. And I have to tell you, I looked around the internet and I watched several videos on YouTube because YouTube, that's a darn good source. And I found one woman who made a honey candy, a honey, kind of a honey candy. But the deal was she had um, only two ingredients and it was the it was the honey and the sugar, which is pretty much what I have plus some vinegar. There were other recipes where people were had all sorts of steps and everything, but this came closest. So the deal was to bring it to a boil without stirring, because if you accidentally have some kind of sugar crystals, that whole thing will just, it will just become hard as a rock and untenable. So I just let it boil without touching. The thing that surprised me, because I knew I needed a target temperature around 255. This thing, they they were kept talking about on these, oh, it's gonna take 15, 20 minutes, uh, less than 10 minutes in my case. Um, it, it came, either I was a little too aggressive with the temperature or I don't know, but it, it came up really, really fast. So I then poured, Initially, I forgot to put the baking soda at the end, but I added it after it was on the, the buttered tray and everything turned a much lighter, prettier color. It was just gorgeous. Um, and then you have to wait for it to cool down so you can handle it. One of the programs, these people had butter on their hands that was like dripping. And I was like, oh, I can't, I don't really need that much butter. Oh boy, you sure do need that much butter because even though I put it a little more lightly, I had the molasses candy sticking to my hands. And it wasn't, you know, I was like, holy, it, you know, I'm telling you this, you probably wouldn't want to eat it. My family finished it today. But you were supposed to pull and pull and pull. And I did it over, over the tray. I just kept pulling it over the tray. And I wasn't doing as good a job as those other people that I watch. So I'm going to have to practice this a few more times in the future. But toward the end, they kind of let them, and I made a half recipe, by the way, because I was not going to have to deal with a lot of stuff that I was going to throw away. And so that was kind of how I finished it, but I don't think I did it completely. You know, the last time I think I pulled a taffy type thing was maybe Girl Scouts. Uh, that's a real long time ago, but Watching those other people, I know I have some techniques that I have to go. Now, what you see right now, this morning, everything had kind of merged together. It kind of just was like, 
what was it like the plates of the on the earth meet, meeting together i don't know but it was just like one big piece this morning so clearly i needed to probably process it longer and i probably uh you know it's a learning curve right um so apple float this was the recipe that really had a life of its own so you you beat the whites and and nicole said it says washington post she goes huh maybe you could go and find the recipe Yes, I think I did sort of. Um, oh well, here's the apple float. So, so basically, you it said like three egg whites. I only beat two because I'm figuring they're dealing with smaller eggs, so I can get away with a smaller quantity of egg whites. And I beat it until it was frothy. Then I added some sugar, and then I beat a beat a beat. Now I regularly hand beat whipping cream you know, five minutes or less, probably less. This took well over, this took about 10 minutes and I'm sitting there beating and beating and beating and I'm like getting tired. I'm like, maybe I should pull out the, the mixer, but no, I really need to try to do this. So I got it to where it was, where it would do a peak, you know, the soft peak, not the stiff peak. They wanted the stiff peak, but at this point I was like tired. Uh, and then somebody had given me a Christmas, a cranberry, uh, a spiced cranberry applesauce, which is effectively what this recipe calls for. And you'll see there's different variations. Sometimes they say grate the apples and fold it in. Some of them make applesauce. But and then so I put uh, some heavy cream and then I. Well, as decorative as I ever get, arranged this um, uh the, the apple meringue, it was quite nice. And my family had gone out for the evening. So when they came home, um, I served some to my mother and she liked it. She liked it so much that my dad's portion that was sitting next, next to it, she took and finished. Fortunately, I had enough for, for the my dad, but nonetheless, it was quite impressive, her enthusiasm, because... That's not always her approach to food. So here's the recipe for the apple float that was in the uh, Washington Post. It's from 1895. The recipe isn't exactly like uh, exactly like the one we have, but. Um, Nancy Webster, who's archivist for the Highland Park Historical Society, pointed out that maybe this recipe had gone on the wire service of sorts. And so other newspapers that might have used their recipes grabbed it. And maybe somebody did a little bit of rewriting along the way, or maybe there was a space issue. So things sort of had a way of changing. Well, I only started to look for this yesterday and, you know, with the Chicago Tribune, you know, I can get through my library and, I, and go to the uh, Wayback Machine to, to, to find archival materials. But I don't have a, I don't have a, um, a Washington Post. So I put out on my Facebook page, if anybody had, you know, this recipe if they, in the Washington Post, I said it's pre-1900, it might even be pre-1890. And my friend Peter uh, Regas, he came up with this recipe. Well, then things started to get even more interesting. Uh, Nancy Webster, our archivist from the Historical Society, she found this recipe also of the apple float, included in an advertisement um, for a for something in that was originating in Oklahoma. Then. Um, a friend of mine, Ann Mendelson, she found a book with this recipe published in it from 1910. And yeah, there's small variation, but it's effectively the same thing. You know, the apple, the egg white, the sugar, you know, the cream or soft custard. It's all about the same. Then uh, Kate McDermott, she found this recipe for the apple float. 
that had been published in the Colored American, a newspaper from Augusta, Georgia from 1865. And, and, and it was in the collection of the Library of Congress. And I'm like, and this recipe, I had found it, but so did my friend Lee Catman. But this is a, another manuscript cookbook from Maryland. And the recipe, the, at least the manuscript cookbook itself was started in 1824. When this was included, I don't know, but it, it's now she went the route of making a custard and putting the uh, the apples on top. But it was like this whole thing had a whole life of its own. And this recipe, I mean, it's, it's somebody's like, I think this recipe has been around for a long time. It sure has. Um, so that's my part of the recipes that I did. So I'll then stop sharing because Nicole has more to say. Well, thanks, Kathy. Um, so we're just going to share a little bit more um, from the cookbooks, and then we're going to invite, so if anyone needs a moment to um, think about what you'd like to share from your experiences, if people tried recipes that we had sent out previously, and I'm sorry if you didn't get that email, um, but we can send those again. Uh, they've been shared in the chat, and we can send those again in an email after the program as well. So all right. So mostly Kathy and I have been working with recipes from Mary Ethel Crofton's cookbook. So the youngest daughter in the Crofton family. But there are two cookbooks in the Dunn Museum's collection. And I've been diving more into the mother's Gabrielle Josephine Schubert Crofton's cookbook. Um, this second cookbook actually has in the front or in one of the covers, um, I should say, Gabrielle J.S. Crofton, Fort Buford, Dakota, May 2nd, 1887. And this cookbook contains various handwriting, as you can see here, and sections that are mixed together from different notebooks or sets of paper or even scraps of paper that were stuffed inside. And though it's marked 1887 on the one page, there are recipes that are noted as being older, such as those you can see here from different forts, 1871 to 72. So these different cookbook sections um, actually show these other forts. They're providing a view into the Crofton's life as a traveling military family, perhaps sharing recipes with other women or families at the different forts that they're stationed at and how these recipes might travel amongst the different people as they traveled as well, the other groups. Um, there are also recipes credited to members of Gabrielle's family, the du DuPonts, showing them the sharing of family recipes over time. And some of these could be much older as well. Um, this cookbook also has newspaper clippings inserted or glued in. And there's actually one here that spells out more exact measurements for recipe notes, like my favorite, butter the size of an egg, which you can see here equates to about two ounces or a quarter of a cupful. So this um, would have been helpful to find earlier on, um, but this cookbook has a lot more to it than Mary Ethel. So we had started with that one first. Um, there's also a handwritten page labeled Table of Equivalents. So that's interesting to think through some of the recipes further with. And we even have newspaper clippings that block part of recipes. So this blocks part of a tapioca pudding recipe and states uh, information about the engagement of someone who is visiting their aunt at Fort Sheridan. So. Um, she's also recording different events during their time at the fort here, too. Now, comparing both cookbooks further, it is interesting to note that many of the recipes included in Mary Ethel's cookbook are actually from Gabrielle's cookbook. So here you can see signs that they are sharing these cookbooks together. Perhaps this was Mary trying to utilize or preserve the cookbook in a new way, perhaps to remember her mother and different recipes. 
Um, but here you can see a recipe for the caramel cake that I mentioned before from Gabrielle's. And it is the exact same one from Mary Ethel's. Both are even credited to the same Mrs. Wheeler. Um, the handwriting in Gabrielle's is also similar to the page where she signed her name. So I believe she wrote this particular recipe in the book. And we, I even found my nemesis, Parker House Rolls. Mm -hmm. um, same one as listed in Mary Ethel's. And this recipe actually appears three different times in Gabrielle's. Um, this one is the same. This one's a little harder to read and has a little bit different notes. Um, and then there's a partial kind of one on a scrap of paper, as you can see at the very bottom here where it says Parker House Rolls. So I tried two new recipes recently as well, and I chose one that appeared in both cookbooks and one that appeared only in Mary Ethel's. So one that I tried was Spanish cream, and this recipe is listed twice in Gabrielle's and once in Mary Ethel's. It contains a Cox box of gelatine, um, and she specifically mentions that brand in a couple recipes that I've noticed. Um, this recipe called for half a box, which would have been two envelopes of gelatine in that time. So I estimated and used one from the Knox brand today. Um, I tried to follow this by softening it in cold water, dissolving it as they noted there. And I had to try to boil the milk for this recipe twice. I tried it in a pan the first time and the temperatures were too hard to control with adding some of the other ingredients. So I created a double boiler and used that to be able to control the temperature better for adding the sugar, the gelatin, and yolks of this recipe later on. And I referenced a modern recipe trying to go back and forth. Um, and you can see here, this is how they turned out. They didn't quite mix together exactly. Um, it's said to um, add the whites of the eggs well beaten, and some other recipes said to thicken them, which I did, and they never quite melded together. Um, they didn't quite solidify either until just today. I tried this recipe Monday, and it took till today in the refrigerator to somewhat get a little more gelatiny and not so liquidy. So I don't know about this one. <laughs> You know, it's an interesting one to, to try. Um, the other one I tried, and here you can see it listed twice in Gabrielle's um, on two very different pages in the book. Um, I also tried popovers, and this was a recipe only in Mary Ethel's that I could tell. Um, and the sweet milk referenced here is whole milk versus buttermilk. It was often labeled that to tell the difference between whole milk or buttermilk. So that's all the sweet milk refers to. And my biggest question was these, with these was, in today's recipes, butter plays a significant role in popovers, and it is not listed here at all. So after doing some digging... I found a Betty Crocker recipe that did not involve recipe, uh, butter. And I also found one from N.T. Oliver's The Century Cookbook, which was published in 1894. And this one also did not include butter and very similar ingredients to the one listed here. So I made sure my ingredients were room temperature though, following more of a modern recipe um, so that they would rise. Um, I had muffin tins, but I didn't have popover tins. So I did a combination of trying muffin tins and mugs that were oven safe. So um, trying both of these, I did grease the mugs, but I did not grease the muffin tins because mine, you don't have to. Um, but here's how they turned out. They did actually rise well. And I realized once they were in the oven, because it's key too that you not open the oven door while baking. So I did not open the oven door. Um, and let them just go. But the recipe tells you that salt should be included, but it never tells you to add it. So I forgot the salt <laughs> in this recipe. Um, so sometimes, you know, paying close attention to those details, they're not always spelled out in those handwritten recipes. But um, I did bake it for 20 minutes at 450 and then lowered the temperature for the last 10 to 15 additional minutes 
till they were golden brown. And they still turned out okay. A little uh, less tasty without the salt, but not too bad. So we would love to uh, hear from some of you. And if anyone tried some of the recipes and would like to share how they went, or, um, you know, especially uh, if they want to share tips or things that they've learned along the way, we'd love to hear. And if you have any questions for Kathy or myself, uh, we're happy to take some of those too. So yeah, I see a hand. Catherine, if you'd like to share. So um, we decided to do the um, stuffed eggs. So um, I can show you, here they are. Yay! 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 <laughs> so when I got to the point where it says dress as for salad, um, I assumed they meant add salad dressing. So I went out and looked for some salad dressing recipes and I found a 19th century recipe called boiled salad dressing. Oh, um, lovely. Yeah, it's from a uh, website is called Old Line Plate. It's uh, cooking in Maryland history. So what we have here is essentially the precursor to um, ranch. It's made with eggs, vinegar, cream, powdered mustard, salt, and pepper. That's it. What did you think of it? it well, it's real interesting because um, I made it and it was really, really sharp. There's no sweet component, like most recipes for dressings, even our modern vinaigrettes have something sweet. There's no sweet in it. Um, it is heavy um, uh, method based. You have to use a double boiler. You have to beat the uh, yellows and yolks separately. You have to beat constant, or I'm sorry, the whites and yolks. You beat constantly while it's being uh, heated. And then once you take it off the heat, you beat it constantly until it is cool. Um, but you do get really good results. So like I said, it's very sharp, very much mustard, very much um vinegar so i used it and made the recipe um i also used it in um uh some slaw that i made today and after several hours in the refrigerator it becomes mellow it oh. loses its sharpness so you know uh, the food writer mfk fisher her mother, grandmother, I think, made these boiled dressings that they hated. But I've always <laughs> wanted to uh, give it a shot. So yeah. I'm glad you had good results with it. I did. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, I, I think I'm going to use it as a base for other creamy type dressings so I could use it up. I mean, here it is. <laughs> Would you do it again? Sure. Um, as a matter of fact, I want to add, I want to add onion. I want to add garlic. I want more, uh, flavor to it. I can understand why it's seasoned the way it is because these were popular and easily obtained seasonings, um, at the time. But I have a question for you. I saw that in the book, there is a, a recipe for white candy. It's one of the, in the list. And I'm curious about it because we have some information from my husband's family in Brooklyn, New York in the 1880s, where um, at their home residence, they said they were running a confectionery, which is interesting because the uh, man of the house was a sea captain who ran sugar from Havana to New York. That was his job. And I believe some of that sugar wasn't going to its original destination, but somehow ending up in their kitchen and they were making candy. So I had been looking around, what was a very popular candy? What was an easy candy? And white candy came up. So I'm interested in recipes that talk about how to make white candy and how a person would make it at home. This is where I would go to my friend called Zoom. And not Zoom, but YouTube. Because it's yeah. amazing the number of of older recipes that people are reviving and showing the technique. And sometimes because they learned it from family, sometimes they just sat there and worked through the issues and were able to recreate it. I, If you make it, will you let us know? I'd love to hear about it. 
because I was having fun with the molasses candy to the extent I was discussing it with uh, Nancy Webster earlier today. And I says, maybe when we have one of our openings at the Stoopy Cabin, I'll make a batch of this and then keep it hot and bring it over and we'll just, and she goes, it's fine as long as nobody brings that candy into the cabin because we don't want to mess that up. We're, but, we're historical reenactors and we do a lot of open oh, fire cooking. Yeah, so we're... open fire cooking, all kinds. Of, I'm mostly fire management and stirring. I'm the appliances and everything. You know? <laughs> but uh, that that's how we get into historical cooking. Yeah, and are you so? Are you like at like these reenactors? Like you go to Civil War type things? What's your uh, strata? Well, we do uh, we do Roman, which is very early cooking. Some Anglo-Saxon, then into medieval. Uh, all the way up through uh, Prohibition era. Is it, what's the name of that organization that you're involved with? Well, no longer several. So, oh, okay. You know, so there, it's not all one organization. But for the more modern um, eras, we uh, work up through the uh, Midway Museum up in Rockford. Oh, okay. Well, we'll have to um, look up. We're we're still working to transcribe that one cookbook too, and I have not transcribed the white candy recipe yet. There are other candies listed in there too, so maybe that will be the next goal is to look more specifically at the candies um, and see what else we can find. There's a lot of recipes for caramels too, especially in Gabrielle's. There's three in a row at one point, um, and they don't seem to be too much difference between them, but I'm still working to some of the handwriting in that cookbook, as you can see, is a little trickier um, than Mary Ethel. She does have decent handwriting. So well, she showed um, uh, her cookies or one of you had the, the cookies that were made and it was very much like my grandmother's or great grandmother's, great -grandmother's molasses cookie, cookie yeah. recipe. No but, flour uh, given. No flour given, <laughs> but. Uh, oh yeah. Be, be, mix it until. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah that, that, we, we just assumed though. about cooking <laughs> back no, no, there was something just no something you typed about slow and fast ovens or yeah it, if they don't i mean usually they will at least give you some direction like slow or fast oven sometimes they don't at all because they assume you know you know what <laughs> kind of oven you need so cookies are hot bread somewhere in the middle um like, you know, can you hold your stuff. hand in the oven Right. A fast oven is if you put your hand in it and it's like hot and you have to pull it out, that's fast. Slow is you can leave it in there a while and you don't get burned, but that doesn't yeah. tell you very much. <laughs> well, and that's why it's hard to adapt to today too sometimes, right? Because it depends if they're using a wood-fired stove or what type of equipment they're using. Um, some of these recipes, especially in Gabrielle's, we're not sure how old they actually are. Um, so lots of different things to figure out, but yeah, very curious to hear how that turns out for you. Um, did anybody else want to share, um, some of your experiences with any of the recipes? I think I saw Tara, another Tara. Tara. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tara. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I am one of those YouTubers of which you speak. Um, <laughs> so I have my own YouTube channel called old fashioned AF and I have done a number of old recipes on there. I also have a website that goes along with that. Um, where I recreate and then try to rewrite some of those recipes. I'm a historic interpreter and I used to work at Klein Creek Farm. Now I just volunteer there, but um, I've done a lot of work at lots of historic sites. And <clears throat> for the, sorry, I saw the cold that I don't know, the thing that's going around that's like putting people out for a week at a time. I'm just getting over that. So I'm sorry, my voice is only kind of half here, but um, for the purposes of this, I I used the easiest recipe because it was the first one and I didn't have time to really look at the rest of them. I kind of wish I had now. Now that I've seen your pictures for the Parker House rolls, definitely want to try those and see what happens. <laughs> yes, keep us um, posted. <laughs> wowie. Um, but I did make the ginger cookies. Hilariously, I got really excited because I had molasses and I almost never have molasses in the house because I mean who does nowadays, but if I have a specific recipe, I'll sometimes have it, and I had found a, a jar, so I was like, okay, I'm going to make these. Didn't have any ginger, so I used um, Madras spice, and it was fantastic. They actually turned out wonderfully, so highly recommend. Obviously, it has ginger in it, so why not? Um, and 
I like a really big cookie. Obviously, our 1890s ancestors would scoff at that and be very upset. But um, but I made them very, very large. I think it took probably 15 minutes in, in the oven at 350 <laughs> to get them to bake. Um, but they were very straightforward. And in terms of the flour, I actually ended up um, adding more than what you did, Nicole. And I think that oh. it made for a much softer cookie, I suspect, at least from your picture. Yeah. Um, so I I think I added either five or five and a half cups of flour. Wow. Um, and then I also halved the brown sugar. Okay. So, and they were, yeah. they were great. So no complaints, but nice. I, well, I love this stuff. So I, yeah. yeah. Well, in my cookies, um, looking back at the video, that was the first recipe I tried from this cookbook. And so one key ingredient I misread was soda. So there is no baking mm. soda in that cookie, oh, which is yeah. also well, probably a difference. The, the texture. The yeah, it changes like the it texture. Was so, it kind of gummy? It kind of looked like it was. A little bit. Um, my grandmother's recipe, those molasses cookies are soft. And they're fairly, they rise um, and they do include baking soda, but it also includes hot water. You're supposed to add boiling water at one point, which makes it easier to stir. So that's why I read it the other way. So that could be another difference between our cookies as well. So I'll have to try yeah. it with baking soda. And that's interesting, the hot water one. I think I've used recipes that have hot water in them before too. Mm -hmm. um and you're right I think it does make it easier to mix because the one thing about this recipe that I was like oh I don't know what's going to happen here is the butter <laughs> never fully incorporated even I did do the 10 minutes do I usually do the 10 minutes of course not but like for this one because it was literally written there I did that um and and the butter was still like in little chunks <laughs> and I was like hmm this is interesting <laughs> this has been a really long time and it never actually creamed correctly so yeah that, yeah. that's probably why because it doesn't have that hot water edition so, so yeah can you that should good the name of your website sure um oldfashionedaf.com and i will actually put it in the that would be great too. that would be great but i don't really do a lot on there my husband's a youtuber too um and so i work for his youtube channel um that's that's my full-time job um but every now and again i will post something on my own stuff so feel free to look out for that. Right. Because when it comes to these, you know, recipes, it's like years ago, we had a, a lecture where they were talking about Baroque music. And he said, if you played Baroque music the way it is, it's very flat, but they added all the trills, the experienced person. So what they're looking at in a lot of these recipes is your experience and you adding it to it. So, you know, like, you might, the recipe might seem very plain, but the person says, oh, well, that's just like, and then they start like you played with the madras, was it curry? Powder? Yeah, it was basically just curry powder. I think the specific kind was madras, but yes. Right, but nonetheless, you just start to experiment because that's now your imprint on the recipe. Oh. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And well, and that's what I love about these things too, is that, I mean, you're literally working with handwritten documents that came from somebody's experiences of a recipe that they probably either got from another person in a book to begin with. So who knows what was lost in translation or what was added in or, or it's shorthand at that point, you know, or it's sort of a shorthand because yeah. you're just like, well, okay, you do this. Okay. I remember now I'll do something else in addition, you know, and when it comes to things like portions, uh, I read this article one time, uh, the, Recipe in the joy of cooking for brownies has never changed, but the portions have changed. So before you could ah. have 16 and now you're, you know, you're far, you know, there's more. Right. It's like way. me and we my cookie, a bigger piece. That big. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But certainly okay. like those ones probably would have been like a teaspoon size, you know, is, right. is what they would have served. So uh, actually my, my sister brought over some cookie dough recently and I was like, these cookies are, it was, it was like this and thick. And I was like, there's no way. And I cut them in half. I looked at them, they're still too big. I cut these things into quarters, rolled them into balls. And then they were the right size, at least for our family and our taste. But for somebody else, they could get the really giant cookie. That <laughs> I, would I figure if on. I make giant ones, then I won't want another one. 
that's that's my philosophy on it but that's only at home i would never do that i push that on someone else by the way talking about like cooking methods and things when people went from an open fire to where they started to use the wood fire the taste of their food changed also they were used to that kind of the the smokiness and everything and they lost Can I that tell you one more here. anecdote before you move on to someone sure. else Okay, so I, I've worked at Klein Creek Farm and I've also worked at um, Historic Wagner Farm, which are sure. both, you know, on either end of Chicago land. And um, one of them uses coal and one of the, them uses wood. And I used to um, make, the only thing that really overlapped was Germanic heritage. Um, everything else is different time periods and everything else. Um, so... I would make um, apple strudel in both places. And that was the only thing that really ever overlapped. Um, but they tasted completely different, even though I used the exact same recipe. And I think it honestly was down to the wood versus the coal. Oh, yeah. I, I, I know like same oven, same everything. All of the stuff that I was making was the same, but one of them had a much deeper taste, which is the wood fired one, like mm -hmm. the one at Klein Creek. And one of them has a much brighter taste, and that's the the cool one. So there you go. No, that's that's fascinating. Or you know, or, I love that stuff. Or uh, my my, you know, or you have somebody like in Ireland where they've been cooking with peat, mm -hmm. and now they go to a wood fired stove or a gas stove, and there's a certain essence that's missing. There's a book that is all about the transition to coal, that was by. Ruth Goodman, I believe, just recently, like it just came out. And I would highly recommend anybody who's interested in the transition from wood to coal to here, coal and wood to coal to wood and then coal again. <laughs> All of the, it depends on where you are in the US, obviously, but um, in the UK specifically is what this is geared toward because Ruth Goodman is a, a, um, an interpreter in the UK. Um, and it talks about how London was the earliest adopter of coal and then goes from there essentially in terms of the history and it talks about some of those things it talks about peat it talks about different types of wood and what their uses were for um for faggots and which of course are the you know sticks that are rolled up and, and tied and used as bundles um to uh to do various household that hold things with like fires etc um, yeah. all of the things it's a very interesting book so many different influences i just want to make sure is there other people that want to say something yeah you i'm great. sorry you I'll, were I'll great, you were great. <laughs> thank you thank um, you yes adina if you'd like to share there we go i, I want, want to say, say hi, hi kathy, kathy. I, I haven't seen you in years because i moved, moved to, to the east coast, coast so i, I, I haven't, haven't been, been around, around but um <laughs> But, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've done, done quite a bit of this, and Kathy has actually worked with me um, in Grace Lake, Lake and other places. places. Um, um, and I, I just, just wanted, wanted to say something about the directions that are bedeviling you so badly. <laughs> um, when, when I used, I used to work with uh, some 18th century, 18th century cookbooks, and the one that, that comes to mind is The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy by Hannah Glass. Glass. And, and my, my favorite, favorite is, is, of course, course the butter, butter the size, size of the hen's egg. egg. And, and also, my real favorite is cook until, until it is enough. enough. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thanks, right? And, 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 and you realize that it, it presupposes so much just common, common knowledge, knowledge at, at the time. time. You know, mm -hmm. you've grown up with an older female in your home, ostensibly, whether it's your mother or a servant or someone, and... You've watched them your whole life. And so you don't need to worry about the niceties. And um, I forget who was saying that, you know, yes, it's like playing um, it's, it's like playing a piece of, of Renaissance or Baroque music. You know, you have the basics and then you do the ornaments on top of it. And um, you know when it's enough because you just open up the door and look, right? Of course, we all know that. Um, so, so it, it does, does presuppose an awful lot of knowledge, um, but, but when, when you're getting, getting really nitty gritty, it's like, like well, butter the size of a hen's egg. Well, well what, what kind of hen's egg? egg? And is it a pea or a jumbo? And, you know, you and you have to use a certain amount of experience. And, and same, same thing with baking. Um, I don't know what kind of yeast you wound up using in the final analysis. But I would guess that in the 1890s, it was more compressed fresh. 
sort of thing. thing. Like, like if, if it was if it was, was fifty or seventy five years, years earlier, I would say it was you know barm like, like from the, the brewer kind of thing. But, but I think, think in this case, case it's compressed fresh, fresh which, which is, is less, less forgiving in hot water and this sort of thing, thing than um, you know what we use the dry yeast we use today. So you have the yeast. One of the the Buffalo Grove um, Museum, the Route Museum. Yeah. They have a bunch of receipts from an, a grocery store uh, from about 100 plus years ago. And one of the things that they sold was frothy yeast. What, what was, was it? it? Frothy yeast. Oh, oh, oh frothy. frothy. And, and I suggested at one point to Nicole, maybe they're talking, I don't know either. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I, I did mention it to Nicole at the time. They also they had a, uh, I suggested maybe sourdough mm -hmm. might be one of those things, one of those things that you kept on the counter just to keep it going. And I go ahead. We were just guessing because it's, it's well, a surprise. That could definitely, that could definitely be, but by, by 1895, I think, I think you're getting much, much more, um, commercial stuff available to people you know and so you know it could have been countertop yeast for sure um but in a place near a big city like chicago and and so forth i don't know also when it, when it comes to the the gelatin um maybe do use two packets because <laughs> You, you know, know I, when, when you said, said it didn't set up, up until, until like three days, days later, later or whatever, whatever I'm like, mm -hmm. mm. yeah, yeah, you probably needed, needed more. more. Yeah, it didn't seem right. But, you know, in the Knox's box today, you get four packets. And in the Cox's one, I looked up, you get, you would receive two. What size the packets were, though, it didn't say, or at least what I had briefly searched to find. So it could be that, that I needed two packets. And maybe that would have turned out a little differently. Um, but I did try the first time I did this, the Parker House rolls, I just used dry active yeast just to try it. And then the second time I used a homemade sourdough starter. Um, mm -hmm. And both times they turned out very much the same for me. So whether it was some of the other steps involved was what I was trying to figure out. Um, if it was wonder, at 10 p.m., 10 a.m. <laughs> you know? Well, I, I think, think that's, that's rising, rising time, maybe. And it could be that too, because it didn't, that was the problem. It didn't rise. When I baked them, they did actually have, you know, more bread consistency inside. They just weren't thick. And then that recipe did not involve much butter like the modern recipes do. And it didn't say to coat them on the top after baking like modern recipes do. So they were not that buttery, fluffy roll um, that you think of. But um, yeah, so if anybody tries, a challenge to you all maybe, if anyone's interested in taking it on, is to try that Parker House roll or try some of the other recipes. And we will send those out again. Um, yeah, if, if I, I can get it, I will. I'll, I'll take, take it, it on. on. I will try. We have it <laughs> hopefully agreed to. <laughs> so and I know where, I know where to find her. Yeah, excellent. So we yeah, will send those favorite. out later. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, I know oh, we went a little bit a over question, here, but I really way. appreciate you sticking around. And I just wanted to share, you know, the one other thing with these recipes is that they um, record a lot of details that could have been lost because as has been mentioned, a lot of these recipes are family recipes that could have been handed down. Um, sometimes those aren't written down. Um, one of my grandmothers, everything was in her head and we don't have a lot of her recipes today because she didn't write them down. So if that was the case for some of these, some of the other recipes included are ones that seem more special occasion food with breads or desserts, um, you know, so that might be why they were written down too. But having these cookbooks and this knowledge preserved is a really unique part of history. And Kathy's doing a lot of work with that. And so Kathy, if you just want to mention quickly where they can find more details of some of your work. And okay. keep an eye out because we'll try doing more with a crofting cookbook. And, and I don't. And before we leave, I want to get to Penelope. 
because she's got her hand up for quite a while. Uh, but what I've been doing is, um, so I have to give all credit to Nancy Webster, the archivist for the Historical Society, because she's the one that kind of prodded me to do this. And it started two years ago, or several years ago, you know, all these pandemic times, you, everything gets messed up. But comparing two com community cookbooks from Highland Park, roughly the same population, uh, but 13 years apart. So 2000, I mean, 1911, 1912, 1925, they had different purposes and functions. And between the populations of the two cookbooks that contributed, three overlapped. But we've been documenting this and we're going to, it's my kind of my, my uh, America 250 project is to, and I chose Highland Park because I live here, you know, easy enough. But uh, I will be getting into this more. I'm doing a talk at the McHenry County uh, Historical Society a week from Saturday. Show up and we'll go into much more detail because I knew we were not going to get into it tonight because it's we, we've had a fun time with all this. But Penelope, I want to hear what you have to say. And Penelope is one really cool person. She uh, used to be a uh, Illinois Road Scholar. And she talked about cookbooks. And she and I are culinary history buddies. Yeah, it's another way of saying I have an out of control cookbook habit. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm sort of, I've, I've put it aside and, and you, you all are inspiring me to, I can't seem to bring myself to, you know, get not, you know, down, downsize with them. But anyway, that isn't what I'm saying. Um, so most of those old cookbooks, uh, the family ones, were primarily recipes that were the things you didn't make every day. You know, the things that you made every day, you didn't need a recipe for. You just put together the cornbread or you put together the yeast bread or those things. And the other thing is that, you know, the, the sweets often take a little more finesse than, say, you know, in, in more modern times, making a meatloaf. I mean, any cook who says that she uses a recipe for meatloaf is lying, you know, or she hasn't been cooking very long. Um, second thing is, one of those recipes that you shared, Nicole, was attributed to a Mrs. Bingham. And mm -hmm. I'd be curious as to who that was. Um, mm -hmm. And the third thing is, as you were talking about popovers and butter and how much is a modern recipe, this is, I don't know if you can see it, it's the, it's the uh, paperback of the 10th edition of Fanny Farmer. And so it's, yeah, it's modern. Um, it got it got me through being first married. I used to take it, actually, this is a a, a, um, a new, new copy from the Newbury, late lamented Newbury Library Book Fair. Uh, my own is in several pieces. Uh, um, this got me through being first married and learning how to cook, but recipes for example their banana bread recipe that was where the cookbook would open and fall apart some like to add two tablespoons of butter now modern ones will have a stick of butter in them and i looked at the popover recipe and it does have butter in it one tablespoon and i i, I bring this up because it's somewhere between our modern way of doing things and what you're looking at. And it might be an interesting uh, perspective of, of seeing how it could be done in this and maybe getting some clue as to what was going on in the earlier uh, version from this. Because of course the original one was published just about the same time um, mm -hmm. in the 1850s. So that's all, it's, this is wonderful. I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. And and I enjoyed being, I haven't watched all these YouTube things. That sounds marvelous. Oh, there, there's, it, it's a rabbit hole, but a delightful <laughs> one, but a yeah. delightful one. And and I, 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 I want to just tell you how much Penelope, I mean, we're not like the closest of friends, but I did bring her a Chicago hot dog during the pandemic because I was talking to her and she said, oh, I haven't had one. I says, I'm bringing you one. It was wonderful. It was, <laughs> yeah. Huh. Well, and I'll have to look into that book. Thank you, because yeah, I, 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 
I've only gotten it from the book fair, but I'm sure it still exists. And it's and it also had a hardcover version. I don't know. I I it it's sort of the um, joy of cooking is fancy cooking. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm talking about the '60s version than than this. It's perspective. Anyway, thank yeah. you. This has been wonderful. Oh, thank you. Well. I hate to end it, but thank you all so much for um, joining us, for sticking around extra time. Uh, We'd still love to hear from you. So you have my email. I will send a follow-up to everyone with links to the recording, to some of the links from the chat and that were mentioned. Um, We'll also include the recipes again. And I didn't send it the first time because I didn't want to overwhelm everyone. Um, But uh, I will try to get up at least on the YouTube um, the actual picture from the cookbook of the recipes so that you can have that too. Um, we just included the transcription to start because we weren't sure who was going to approach it this time and wanted to keep it a little more simple. But um, we'll look into that for the next time too. And um, yes, I see some comments. Maybe we'll have another one of these in the future too. So keep an eye out for Crofton in the name of a title. Um, for the programs with the Lake County Forest Preserves. And you can find lots more of those coming up on our website, um, as well as programs with the Highland Park Historical Society and many others where you might and see Culinary Kathy's Historians case. of yeah. Chicago, which is culinaryhistorians.com or .org. You'll still find our website. Yeah. And any others to share, Kathy, before we let everybody go? <laughs> no, I think we're doing well. All right. Doing very well. well, if you have questions too, please feel free to reach out or tips. Um, you know, my uh, family can only take so much of me talking about this, but I love to talk about it because I find it fascinating coming into this um, as a, a baker, but not a historic uh, baker uh, to start. So um, I hope everyone, uh, if you haven't tried any, try some, let us know how it goes and uh, we'll see you all hopefully in another program. So thank you so much for joining tonight. Um, you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank, thank you, Nicole. Very much. And, and Kathy, Kathy, great, great to, to see you and um, reach, reach out, out anytime. anytime. I shall, I shall. Thank you everybody. Bye. Bye.